Well, good morning, everybody. How many of you are glad that you're here? How many of you are worshiping with us? We want to say thank you, those that are worshiping with us over in the FLC, also in the main auditorium today, those that are worshiping online, and everybody is here today. If you're glad you're here today, come on, give God a big, great big praise and give Him glory. Yes. Hey Amen. It's good to see you guys, man. I'm telling you. Now, we, we, we finished up this series uh, last Sunday called 23, and it was about Psalm 23. And uh, it was about this uh, unusual relationship with the shepherd and the sheep and the sheep and the shepherd. Now, I noticed that when I was preaching that series that I would make this statement that we all know that the sheep need the shepherd. And when I would say that, I'd get, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know. In this service, I'd get, mm-hmm, all right. Some of the other service I'd get, whatever. But anyway, uh, so, uh, but, but, we, but, but when I would say the sheep need the shepherd, we'd all kind of agree. And then I made the statement, and the shepherd needs the sheep. And when I'd made that statement, many of you would like, mm, I'm not so sure about that. And, uh, and I'd get those kind of, you know, really? I mean, you know, because, you know, God is God, and does God need anything. And so, uh, so what I want you to do in, the, in all of our campuses, I want you to take your Bibles and uh, two, two, uh, two passages of Scripture I want you to turn to. First of all, Genesis chapter 2. Uh, everybody take your Bible to Genesis chapter 2 and then put a marker there. And then we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to go back and examine something out of the life of David and Goliath. But we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2 and 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now, uh, everybody find that. Now, uh, I, I understand that many of you are listening uh, to the driving ins uh, every morning on WCLN at 7.15, driving in with Pastor Jeff. Yes, all right, thank you. There are two of you, listen, God bless you. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, a lot of you listen to that, and I understand from the radio station that a whole lot of people are listening to that. We even have, we have even, I've understood this, we have even have families that will get up and that the driving in will be their catalyst for their morning devotion with their kids. And I thought, that's pretty cool. And uh, so anyway, so many of you come to me and you say, man, I love the driving ins. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, and some of you say, man, it is amazing. And some of you said this. You said, it is amazing what you can say in two minutes. And I know what you're meaning by that, and, and, and I appreciate it. You're saying it's amazing what you can say in two minutes, Monday through Friday. Why can't you do that on Sunday? I know you won't say that, but anyway, that's kind of what you're, you're thinking. So today, I'm not going to give you a two-minute thought, but I am going to give you a three-word thought, a three-word statement that will radically change all of our lives if we would just grasp this. I'm going to give you a three-word statement in three words, something that you'll never look at God again, you'll never look at your relationship with God again in the same way. Here's the three-word statement. You already know it. God needs you. Everybody say it with me. On all of our campuses, everybody say it together. God needs you. Now, when I say that, I, I know I get a little strange looks, and, and, I, and I realize that I'm there. Some, probably somebody said, well, you know, I, I'm not quite sure about that. And you're going to have to explain that a little bit, Pastor Jeff, and I, I plan to do exactly that. But God needs you. Now, if you've ever done any public speaking whatsoever, if you ever had to give that, you know, that, that uh, semester in report, or you had to get up in front of a group of people and do, and do a report, or any kind of public speaking, or, or anything like that, or even if you're a Sunday school teacher or whatever, then, uh, then good public speaking, and if you've ever taken a course on it, they'll tell you that what you need to do is you need to start off and tell the people that you're talking to what you're going to say. Then uh, you need to say it, but in your say it, you need to give a couple of points to back it up. And then you need to finish by telling them what you just said. And that's, that's, that's a good public speech. You know, tell them what you said. Give some, uh, tell them what your topic is. You've got to have a topic. Tell them what your topic is. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Give a couple of sub points to, you know, to kind of back up what you're telling them. And then finish up by telling them what you just told them. So I understand that. I mean, that's, that is my livelihood. That's how I've made a living. That's how, what God called me to, to be a communicator and to do just that. And so the title of my message today is God Needs You, and point number one is God doesn't need anything. 
Now, I've already broken the great rule of public speaking. I know that, but hang in there with me because I'm going to back this up. You're going to be glad you came today. Everybody on all of our campuses, everybody here, turn to the person beside you and say, I'm going to be glad I came today already. Go ahead and tell them that, all right? We'll be glad you came today, all right? Now, so my first point is God doesn't need anything, all right? Because deep down, we all know that God is God. And God doesn't need anything. He's creator God. And so we, 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 we see that. And uh, he, cre- he created everything. Uh, God uh, is, uh, is, is self-existing. Uh, he's self-sustaining. Uh, he is self-sufficient. He is all-sufficient. God is God. And he doesn't need anything. And, and there's something about that that certainly rings true in all of our life. I don't know if you've ever, anybody here and anybody on all of our campuses, anybody ever been to Alaska? I have people been to Alaska. Okay, several of you been to Alaska. Now, anybody ever been on the Alaskan cruise? You've been on one of those Alaskan cruise? I'm telling you, you need to go on Alaskan cruise. It's just absolutely amazing and it's awesome. And I remember uh, several years ago, Phyllis and I were on Alaskan cruise and uh, we had one of those rooms that had a little balcony on it, you know, and we just stayed out there. It was just it was amazing. So we're on this balcony one day, and 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 we're we're and it's just it's just absolutely gorgeous. It's massive. The mountains and the, you know, and and the nature that's in Alaska is just it's bigger than life. And I'm standing on the balcony and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking about God. I mean, you're just you're you're huge. I mean, you, your creation is just huge. God, you're you're a big God. You're you're huge. And as a matter of fact, I kind of even said it kind of out loud. I said, God, you're. You're huge. Now, i got to tell you something. You're on a romantic vacation with your wife standing behind you. You better be ready to explain why you just said, God, you're huge. I mean, can we get an amen, all right? Is there, everybody, everybody follow me right now, all right? So, so anyway, so, but, but, the, but the, the vastness and the bigness of God just kind of overwhelmed me because God is a big God, and all God's people said, man. So God doesn't need anything. He's self-existent. He's self-sufficient. He's self-sustaining. He doesn't need anything. As a matter of fact, if you want to, you can go back and you can, you can quote me a scripture, or you can go back and quote to God one of his own verses out of his own Bible. Hold your place there and look at the book of Acts just for a moment, chapter 17. Look at Acts chapter 17. Look at verse 24. Listen to what Paul said when he was preaching the sermon on, 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 in Athens to, to all of those that even had a, you know, they had a, 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 an altar to an unknown God. Listen to what Paul said in Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 24. He said, God made the world and everything in it, and the Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples built by his hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. There's something in us, of course, that rings true. And we'd all say amen and amen to that. God, you can't contain God. God is God and he doesn't need anything. But what I'm going to do real quickly today, I'm going to take a couple of verses and I'm going to marry up these two thoughts and before you leave here today, you're going to be glad you came because I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to theologically marry up these two thoughts that God doesn't need anything, and yet God needs you, and God needs me. And we're going to, we're going to go on a journey, and we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to take this together, all right? So you ready? Say amen. Amen? All right? So now, here's my second point. My second point is this. God decided to need you. God decided to need you. You see, God doesn't need us to exist, but how many of you know God decided to need us to coexist? God decided to need you. God decided to need me. And God decided to need us not to exist, but to coexist. Now, let me, let me try to back that up with some scripture today. Everybody turn to the book of Genesis in chapter 2. Book of Genesis chapter 2 and look at verse 19. Very familiar passage of scripture. Genesis 2, 19. And listen, listen, what, listen what the Bible says here. Very familiar. You've, you've read it a hundred times. You've been in church any length of time. But listen to what he said. Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. Now, the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. Now, how many of you believe God's creator? God say amen. All right. All right, and out of the air. And he brought them to the man, 
Now, now man has all, all already been created. He brought him to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. Now, here's my question. Why? I mean, why? God's God. I mean, you know, why, why, did, why did he give Adam this responsibility? Why, why did he do that? Now, now you remember that uh, on, 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 this was just the beginning, and on the eve or at the end of God creating all the animals and bringing the animals to Adam and Adam having the responsibility of naming the ad, uh, animals, you remember that on the end of that, this is when God calls Adam to fall asleep. And, uh, and, and I, don't know, I don't know how that went down. I, I don't, did, did he just go, fall asleep all at once? Or did he kind of just get sleepy, you know, and naming the animals? I don't know. I think, I, I can't back this up. This is, this is just me. I'm just kind of weird that way. And maybe I have too much time on my hands. I don't know. But I'm kind of thinking that the animals that he was naming right before he fell asleep were birds. I mean, and the reason why I say that is because when he first started naming birds, I mean, it was very creative. I mean, you know, there's an eagle. You know, there's a falcon. I mean, you're very creative. And then he starts getting, starts getting a little sleepy. And he's, uh, there's, oh, that bird, that bird's black. Black bird. <laughs> you know this is me, right? You, you, you know, there is no Bible to back this up. Y'all do understand that, okay. Blue bird and then right before he goes out he's got his eyes closed and this next bird he don't even see he just hears it humming bird. <laughs> so anyway so so God it's just stupid all right so God 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 puts him to sleep all right, and when he wakes up, we know what happens. God, God presents him a wife, I mean, a woman. So, all of this time, he'd been naming these animals, and every animal had a mate, and he didn't have a mate for himself. And so when he wakes up, God says, here she is. And he goes, whoa, man. I mean, you know, I mean, maybe not. But anyway, uh, you know. So, so now, now my point is this, why? I mean, why did God do that? He's God. God could have presented to him an ostrich and said, Adam, that's an ostrich. God could have, God could have presented him a woman and said, Adam, this, this is woman. Woman, this is man. Y'all have, have fun. I mean, he could, you know, he could have done, but he, but he didn't do that. God chose to do it this way. Why? Because I want you to listen to me. Listen to me say amen. Come on. Because God, God chose this. God said, listen, I want man and woman to have a partnership with me in determining the affairs that are going to happen on the face of the earth. And all God's people said. Now, now whether you grasp that or not, I'm telling you that will radically change your life. It will radically change everything. You see, because so God could have done that, but God chose not to do that. And I want you to, I want you to listen to this statement and, and see if it doesn't ring true, all right? Now, I want you to follow me. And those of you that are students of the Word of God and students of Bible study, I want you to listen to this statement and see if this is not true and, you, and, and, you, and see if you, can't, you can back it up, all right? Because I think this is a true statement. Here it is. God does nothing on this earth without a partner. Now think about it. Do you remember what God said before he put Adam to sleep? He said it is not good for man to do what? Be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. And let me ask you, was Adam... Yes or no? Was Adam created in the image of God? Yes, Adam was created in the image of God. That doesn't mean he doesn't look like, doesn't mean he looks like God, but it means he has the same attributes of mind and emotion and a will and all of that. Like God, man is created in the image of God. And God said, listen, it's not good for man to be alone. He's not just talking about sexually. He's not just talking about, uh, you know, he's talking about practically as well. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. And God does nothing. God does nothing on this earth without a partner. As a matter of fact, I can back it up. In the book of Mark, chapter 6, we don't have time to turn to it, but in Mark chapter 6, 
In the early part of chapter 6, you know what happened? Jesus goes back to Nazareth. Jesus is from Nazareth. You know what the Bible says? The Bible, the Bible says that in Nazareth, Jesus could do no miracle there. Now, it doesn't mean that he wouldn't do a miracle there. The Bible is explicit and says Jesus could not do a miracle there. Why? Because of their unbelief. He didn't have a partner. He didn't have anybody to raise up and partner with him. And God said, I can't do it. I can't work without a partner. And God does nothing on this earth without a partner. I want you to listen to this. All right, L listen, pay close attention. You might want to write this down. God has chosen to limit his unlimited power on this earth to our willingness to partner with him by faith. Oh, that's good. This, this, this sermon is a whole lot better than y'all think it is, all right? This, this is one of those sermons you're going to go back, and you need to get back online, and you need to listen to this thing about four or five times, and you'll start to get it. But God, listen to me, listen to me. God has chosen by his sovereignty, by his power, by his might. God has chosen to limit his unlimited power on this earth to our willingness to partner with him by faith. That's a powerful statement. That means this business of saying, well, God will do it through somebody else. Don't wash. This business saying, well, let them do it. Let, let, you know, let somebody else do it. Let somebody else give. Let somebody else serve. Let somebody else do the work. Doesn't get it. Because God says, I want to, hey, listen, and by the way, is, is it this, this, is this kind of ring true in your life? Is there anybody here, and you don't have to raise your hand and say amen or anything like that, but is anybody here, you ever, you ever know there's just something in your mind that you know that God works, that you know God has the power, that you know God has all power in heaven, but for some reason it's not working for you? You, you, ever, you ever been in that situation where you just know God's done it for others and you just know God can come through and God can work, but it doesn't seem to be working in you and it doesn't work. And a lot of Christians get, you know, a lot of believers get kind of upset with this and a lot of them fall out and they back off and they, and they walk away from the faith. That doesn't mean they're lost, but they walk away from the faith. Why? Because they, there's, there's something in them that says, you know what? I know God is God. God is God, but he's not coming through for me. And all the time God is saying, I am God. And, but you're the one limiting me. I'm God. I can do anything, but I've got to have a partner. I've got to have a willing partner. I've chosen. I've set it up that way. And there's some people here who say, man, God, why don't you hear my marriage? Why don't you heal my finances? And God says the whole time, I want to heal your marriage. I want to heal your finances. But in your marriage, you and your wife or your husband, you keep putting me on the back burner, and everything else is more important in your life than I am. And in your finances, you're robbing me. And God said, I want to do all these things if you will let me, but I can't. Not only I won't, I can't because you refuse to partner with me. And all God's people say that's awesome. That could be the answer for some of you here today because God says, I want to radically change your life. Not that I won't. You think God won't. And God gets a bum deal. He gets a bum rap because you have the audacity to think God won't do it. And God said, that's no, not I won't do it. I can't do it because you won't partner with me. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Now, let me show you what I mean. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to try to back this up. Let me show you what I mean. Everybody take your Bible. Turn me and please the book of 1 Samuel and chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, all right? Very, very quickly. Very familiar story. We, we, we touched on it a couple of weeks ago with David and Goliath. I'm going to go back to that. There's, there's so, many, so many rich things in the story of David and Goliath. 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning at verse 8. 1 Samuel 17, beginning at verse 8. This is what he said. Now, this is, this is Goliath speaking. Then he, this is Goliath, stood, and remember, Goliath is over nine feet tall, and we, we won't get into all the, you know, the massiveness of him and the warrior of him and the fear of him. And he, Goliath, stood, and he cried out to the armies of Israel, and he said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? 
Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants as well. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. By the way, he just said, I defy God. I defy your God. Philistines had a God on every corner, behind every bush, and in every tree. And so the Philistine is saying, I defy this God, this God you claim to be the one true living God of Israel. I defy him this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. Now, it's right here that if you had been God and I'd have been God, I'd have struck that sucker with a lightning bolt. Can I get an amen? Amen? I would have, I would have blown him up. Right in front of everybody. He said, no, 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 no. You're not going to diss me like that. You're not going to dishonor me like I am the one true living God, and everybody's going to see it. And I would fry him right on the spot. Can he get an amen? Amen? But God didn't do that. He didn't do it. Now, why? Don't, how many of you think God could have done it? But if you ever ask yourself why God didn't do it, I'll tell you why God didn't do it. He couldn't. He couldn't. Maybe, and once again, speculation on my part. Don't, don't try to find verses of Scripture for this. It's not there. But maybe a conversation, and we do know that God and Satan had conversations in heaven. We do know that. So maybe... The conversation with him, because here's, here's the deal. If, if God has chosen to limit his unlimited power to our willingness to partner with him on this earth, how many of you think the devil knows that? He knows that. So maybe a conversation in heaven while, while Goliath is doing this, maybe a conversation in heaven went like this. The devil goes up to God and says, see, I got you. I know how you work, God. I know what you have chosen to do with man. You have chosen to limit your unlimited power on the face of the earth to somebody that will step up by faith and partner with you. I know that. And my man, Goliath, has got them all scared. My man, Goliath, has them all shaking it. One man, my man, Goliath, has them all. So, God, surrender Israel over to me right now. This is a done deal. Put a fork in them. They are are done because you don't have a man and you need a man. You don't have a person and you need a person and they're not there. So just surrender them because I know how you operate. Whereby God probably said, I don't need a man. I'll just use a boy. And all God's people said, amen. Oh, that was good. That was good. I'll just use a boy. Hey, you know what my point is? It don't matter. Man, woman, boy, girl, anybody that will partner with God by faith, God will richly bless their life. Somebody say amen. Amen? amen. That's right. That's right. God said, I don't need a man. I'll use a boy. And it's at that moment when little David stepped up to the plate and God richly, richly used him. Point number three, here it is. Have you decided to need God? That's the question. God didn't do anything. He's God. He's, co he's, he's, co he's self-existing, self-sufficient, self-sustaining, but God has chosen to need us. He has chosen to limit his unlimited power on this earth to our willingness to partner with him by faith. That's why the Bible says without faith it's what to please God, impossible to please God. He chose it to be that way. I don't know why he chose it to be that way. He's God, but he did. He did. So now here's the question. The question of the hour is this. Have you decided you need God? See, when the offering plate's passed in about 10 minutes in this church, many of you are going to decide whether you need God or not. Somebody ought to say amen with that. Yeah. Sunday after Sunday, many of you have already decided whether you need God or not because you're not willing to partner with him with your finances. This church is suffering 
because of your unwillingness to partner with Jesus for some of you. Bless God, not all of you, but for some of you. Your, your lifestyle, your lifestyle shouts and says, I'm, I'm willing to partner with God to go to church. That's about as far as it goes. God said, no, I don't play that game. So have you decided you need God? Now, very quickly, let me, let me, give, you three, let me give you three points on this. Sub, let me give you three things on this, on this deal about have you decided that you need God? Because understand this, it's always been this way. God has a part and we have our part. How many of you know that? God has a part. And we have our part. And I know what you're saying. I know, I know, I know I'm going to get emails and say, well, you know, it's by faith. Listen, Pastor, no, no, no work, God, no, nobody can work to earn their favor with God. I'm not saying that. I'm saying what James said. James said, yes, you're saved by faith. Show me your faith by your works. Because if you don't show me your faith by your works, your faith means nothing. And all God's people say so it means nothing. You can go ahead, go ahead, come in here and come in there and lay Baptist church and sit here and amen me all you want to and clap and shout and all that. But if you're not working, you don't have a ministry, you're not serving, it means nothing to God. You're not partnering with God. And your worship is empty. And that's why you go back Monday through Saturday and live like the devil and then wonder why God don't speak to you on Sunday. So the bottom line is he said, listen, there's your part and there's my part. And God's going to be faithful in doing his part, but he, there is a part for you and there is a part for me. Now, I'm going to give you three points about that. Number one, God, come on, somebody listen to this. God is never going to do your part. Amen. He's never going to do your part. Never. I mean, you can pray about it all you want to. You can cry and you can scream, but God is never going to do your part. Because see, here's what we do. We pray with God, God, do my part. God, if you're God, why don't you do my part? God, why don't you come through for me? God, why don't you speak to me? God, do my part. And God said, I'm never going to do your part. It's not. There's, there are things that you got to do, and I'm not going to do it. And I'm not going to step in. Jesus is a gentleman. I'm not going to break the door down. I'm not going to do your part. It was a single mom. And, uh, man, she was raising a couple of kids by herself. One was a little baby, and she was getting very frustrated. And she just called out to God. She said, God, for once, for once, why don't you come through for me? For once, why don't you? I would just, look, God, you know what I'd love for you to do? And I know you can do this because you God. You can do anything. I'd love for you to just change one of my baby's diapers just one time. You know what God said? God said, I'm the Lord God. I change not. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so... You, How many of you know there's a part God is not going to do? Go ahead. Go ahead and say, God, give me an A on that test. Go ahead all you want to. Cry and say, God, give me an A on that test. God said, I will. If you'll study. Yeah. Amen? God, help me in my finances. God said, I will if you quit blowing them. Yeah. Come on. There's your part. There's God's part. Number two. Your part is never supernatural. In other words, come on, come on. I'm going to encourage you right now. God will never ask you to do anything you can't do. Never. Your part is never supernatural. You, you heard people say this. Well, you know, God won't put on you more than you're able to bear. That's just not true. That scripture don't even mean that. That scripture is talking about temptation to sin, and God never will put temptation to sin on you you can't bear because he will always make the way to escape, and his name is Jesus, and all God's people say that. But there's, there, are, there are things on your life you cannot bear. You just can't do it. Quit trying, and quit trying to make people feel guilty because you can't bear it. Because you can't bear it. Because God don't expect you to. He never expects you to do something you can't do, and I can't do and carry those burdens and carry those things and trying to carry people problems and trying to change somebody's life that's not your realm ma'am you can't change him sir you can't change her you can't change anybody man listen that's God's realm so quit trying to do what only God can do and let go and bless God let God do it and all God's people say Amen. he's never going to expect you to do something you can't do. I'm going to go back to David very quickly, very quickly. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Go all the way back down to verse 48. 1 Samuel 17. All the way. I want you to see this. I want you to see something this morning. All right? You guys with me today? All right. Good. How about you guys on campus, man? You guys watching me on the screen? Wake up! All right, here we go. 
They'll, they'll do it now. All right. 1 Samuel 17, verse 48. So it was. I want you to see this. This is amazing. So it was that when the Philistine rose and he came and he drew near David to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it. Stop right there. That's all David could do. That was it. God had taken David to the very extreme for what David could do, and that's all that David could do. And because David was willing to partner with God by faith, then God took over. And you see it. Look what happened. And struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead. Now, everybody, just, just think about it. There's only, there, were, there was only one little tiny chink in Goliath's armor. One little spot in his forehead that he could be vulnerable to. And what are the odds that one guy, a little boy, with a sling and a rock would hit that one spot to the point that it killed him right on the spot. Well, there are no odds in that. That is supernatural in all God's people's head. By the way, I mean, I'll, pr- I'll prove it to you. I-, I love this. I'll prove it to you. If you, if, you, if you doubt me before now, look how supernatural this was. Oh, this will bless you. Listen. He struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone began to, to sink into his forehead And he fell on his face to the ground. Now, now think about that. You get here, somebody's running, you get here, where do you think normally you would fall? Fall backwards. He fell on his face. You know why? God pushed him. Can I get an amen? Amen? Amen. David didn't kill Goliath. God did. But David had a part in it because he was willing to partner with God. And God couldn't do anything about it until somebody, anybody, stepped up to the plate and said, bless God, I'm just a little boy, I'll do it. And God said, that's all I need. Amen? And that's all he needs from you, and that's all he needs from me. That's it. Moses held up a rod. That's all he could do. I can do that. Put a stick in my hand. I can hold it up, but I can't part the Red Sea. The disciples gave out a little bit of loaves and a little bit of fish to some people. I can do that. You can do that. I can give out some loaves and fishes to some people, but only God can feed 5,000 of them on that loaves and fish. And all God's people say, there's your part and there's God's part. But the question is, are we willing to do our part so that God will do his part? And you think somebody else is going to do it. You think in a church this size, I hear it all the time, well, in a church this size, that that has, I don't care if we had 100 million people in this church, that does not take away that God needs you. In God's dear name, how are you, partner? Don't you worry about me, and don't you worry about the deacons, and don't you worry about the Sunday school teachers and all that. How, in God's dear name, is he parting with you? What is your part in the kingdom of God, with God? And all God's people said, God needs you. And here's the third thing, very quickly. Your part is always next. Your part's always next. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, draw near to God, and he will do what? He will draw near to you. Now, does that not sound backwards? I mean, shouldn't that say, God, draw near to you, and you draw near to God? No, it's not backwards. You know why? God's already drawn near to you. He's already made the first move. 
Bless God, he left heaven's glory. He died on the cross. What other kind of move is he going to make? He's already made the first move to you. He's already said, if you'll trust me, I'll save you. I will no wise cast anybody out. So the Bible says, you draw near. Your part is always next. God's not going to make you get baptized. Your part's next. Your part is to follow the Lord and be believers' baptism. God is not going to make money come down from heaven. Your part is to trust God with your finances. God is not going to, is not going to miraculously heal your marriage. Your part is you and your wife draw near to God and partner with him. And all God's people say, you know what seems unfair? The Bible says that when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, Death came upon who? All of us. All of us. That seem fair to you? I wasn't living back then. I ain't come close. Dave Clark comes close, but he didn't, even he. <laughs> even, even him wasn't living back then. Does that seem fair to you that one man sinned and I got to pay a price and my children have to pay a price and everybody in the world has to pay a price because of one man? Doesn't seem fair. Let me tell you, it's not fair. You know what it is? It's brilliant. It's awesome. It's brilliant. Let me tell you why. Listen. One man sinned and we all had to pay a price but God fixed all that, come on, with one man. One man got it all back. And it ain't you getting it back, it's him getting it back. But if you want it back, your move is next. Amen? So are you partnering? Will you partner with God? In God's dear name. What is it in your life that God is saying, I need you, and will you step up to the plate? Let's pray together. Every head bowed, every eye closed.